Uh, good morning. Glad to be back in Krakow and certainly glad to be back at the European Labour Mobility Congress. So first of all, I would like to thank um, all the members of the European Labour Mobility Institute, certainly Marek, um, for inviting us and to have this, this panel on posting of third country nationals. I would say in search of the truth, but as you know, I'm a poor economist and therefore I invited four legal experts. So first of all, we have uh, Griga Serban. Um, he's from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. He's really an expert in, in social security law. Uh, you might know him also because he's a coordinator of the MOVES Legal Network. Um, we also invited another uh, legal expert, namely uh, Dolores Carascosa. She's an, uh, also a legal expert. She's also involved in the, the MOVES Legal Network as the national expert for Spain. Another legal expert is Hans Benson. Uh, Hans um, works in, in Frankfurt for Fragoman. Um, any question you have with regard to migration to Germany, you should ask to him. And certainly with regard to the Van der Els visa, I think we have a lot of questions uh, today. And last but not least, we invited, of course, um, the Commission. Uh, we asked Carita um, Ramus. Well, about several questions we have, of course, about the topic of posting third country nationals. Uh, and I consider us really as the legal expert within the unit competent for labor mobility and also ELA. If you have specific legal questions related to the topic of posting and more related to the topic of posting third country nationals. So, yeah, why did we invite it? experts from Germany, from Slovenia, uh, from Germany, uh, but also, well, I'm self from, from Belgium. I, I think it's clear. Eh? Uh, when you look at the discussion we have on posted third country national, I think there is a certain concentration uh, of this phenomenon. Namely, some main sending member states like Poland, like Slovenia, Lithuania and Spain are the main sending member states of posted third country nationals, mainly received by, let's call them again, the Western European member states, namely Austria, Belgium, France, and question mark Germany, because, well, Germany, you do not see that in the figures. Well, we know, uh, based on, on yeah, all the literature, that certainly also Germany is not one of the main receiving member states of posted third country national. Where do they provide services? Well, mainly, again, in construction sector, in road freight transport, living care. But, uh, for instance, when you look at the flow from uh, to, to France, it's also certainly in agriculture. Here I provide you an overview of the main routes of um, post third country national, where you have an overview of yeah, what's the nationality of this post third country national. And what we observe is that they mainly have nationality from Ukraine, Belarus, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Morocco, and Brazil. It's not a complete overview, that's clear. Um, and then what are the hubs? What are the corridors? Well, uh, they mainly are sent uh, by, for instance, Poland, Lithuania, when we speak about Ukraine workers. But the same goes also from the people from Belarus. Mainly they are posted from Poland and Lithuania. Um, of course, we will discuss also the topic uh, and the issue of the involvement here in, in Slovenia. And there we see that most of them have the Bosnian uh, nationality, are posted uh, to Austria. And here you see, the, again, the overview of yeah, the, the main sectors involved. It's mainly about living care, construction, road freight, transport, and to some extent also agriculture. <laughs> well, I, I think during this morning, it, it was already clear why this is an important topic. This gives you just an overview of why should we have this topic. Well, I, I think it's clear. Eh? The last uh, European Labour Mobility Congress was, I think, in 2019. We never had the intention to organize a panel on post third country national in 2019. Because when you looked at, at that moment at the phenomenon, it was hardly existing, I would say. 
And then all of a sudden, in, I think it was in 2009, 2020, we, we noticed an enormous increase of, of posted third country nationals. Question is, of course, what brings the future? What brings the future also because of the impact of the war in Ukraine? And, and perhaps also, well, are we overestimating um, the impact of posting, but also overestimating the impact of posted third country national on our European labor market? That's definitely an important question to tackle. It was already mentioned. Well, different treatments, um, treatment of these posted third country national compared to the local worker, compared to also posted workers with an EU nationality, um, and certain risk, certain risk of double dependence, certain risk also of underpayments, and yeah, sometimes also labor exploitation. Uh, I, I think, and it was already mentioned also, the concern of an administrative burden for the posting undertaking sending these posted third country national, for instance, to Germany. I think, and it was already mentioned also, well, the, the broader debate about access of third country nationals, some of them will be posted third country nationals, to the European labor markets is important. It was just, well, I think three, uh, three weeks ago, an interesting report published by ELA uh, with regard to the quantitative and qualitative labor shortages we are confronted with in the European Union, there the question pops up, okay, to what extent can this be solved by third country nationals uh, directly sent to European member states or by uh, posting? What we also notice is, of course, yeah, the question of is this complementary or substitute this already these local workers, but also the posted workers. And, and for instance, when you look at the figures uh, for Poland, you sometimes have the impression that it's complementary, but in other more specific sectors of activity, it can also sometimes be a substitution of, of Polish workers, uh, I think, again, for several reasons. It was already mentioned also about well, the issue of yeah, the reality. It's not only by using a work permit that these workers enter the European labor market. No, when you see, for instance, at the, in the policies of Slovenia, uh, also the policy here in, in uh, Poland with the declaration on untrusting work, we notice that there are more existing flexible uh, multilateral and, uh, and, and bilateral agreements used by, by several member states with, which give these third country nationals access to that specific member state, but actually access to the European labor market. Last but not least, I think it was already mentioned also by Herwig, well, the question, can it be a business model? Can they just be hired and then immediately post it to another member state? Also sometimes seeing that not all these posting companies actually provide substantial activities in their member state of establishment. Um, here I quote, I think, a very interesting article um, of, of of Martin also, I think because, yeah, I think it's already more than 15 years that we have this discussion about social dumping, it was already mentioned. And here again, I think we are perhaps in an East versus West divide because we see some Western European member states would like to limit access of third country nationals, while certain, the main sending member states use third country nationals and, and are actually a gate opener for these posted third country nationals. Brings me to, well, why um, this is important for Germany, Slovenia, and, and, and of course also Spain. Well, let's start with Van der Els visa. Again, I quote here in, in, in a recent publication where it's clear that it's a major hindrance to um, employers sending posted workers uh, to, for instance, Germany. Uh, for Slovenia, I, I think here um, it's important to always um, question why is this or could this be a concern? Uh, and here I think it's clearly stated uh, that this might be a concern in several sending member states. For instance, in Slovenia, where you definitely see an over-representation of these posted third country national compared to the group of third country nationals already living and working in Slovenia. Uh, when you look at, yeah, for instance, the share of this group 
in the total labor market in Slovenia, it's limited to 10%. It's a reality, and that's also the reality we see in, of course, Poland and Lithuania. For instance, when you look at Poland, it's around 70% are third country nationals. Uh, but the remarkable thing in Slovenia, for instance, is that of this 10%, well, an enormous group is immediately posted to another member state. So, for instance, 60% in total are third country national, and especially in the construction sector, where you see that 8 out of 10 uh, employed in the construction sector are posted to another member state. Um, so, therefore, I think we have a lot of questions to our Slovenian expert with regard to posting third country nationals from Slovenia to other member states. We also have a lot of questions uh, for our uh, Spanish expert relating to the Terra Fucundis case, because when you had a look at the French newspapers, it has been called the biggest trial in the history of posted labor in France uh, agriculture. Well, is this an important case? I think for several reasons this is important, uh, because yeah, you are confronted with a temporary work agency, um, that's one, and they were posting third country national. So the combination of, of both um, uh, indicators important to, to have this discussion. So without further ado, let's start with the discussion. Yeah, and I think, well, it's clear already for the, uh, from the discussions we had this morning, I should start, of course, with Hans, uh, because I think everyone here in the audience has a lot of questions related to yeah, what are the additional administrative uh, requirements imposed by Germany when, for instance, uh, posted third country nationals are sent from uh, Poland uh, to Germany of course, mainly referring to the Van der Elst um, visa. So Hans, um, yeah, what are actually the, the additional requirements um, they, they should um, comply with? And referring also to the Van der Elst visa, yeah, when should one apply for it and, and how can we apply for it? Great, okay, so Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and I don't speak on behalf of all of Germany, so I'm just speaking to you about, about the local requirements. So as so many of the speakers already today have gone through, these, the, these will be some points that you will have heard. Um, but the biggest impediment, the biggest requirement for Germany at the moment is the visa. Okay, and so, um, and, that, and that's a very unique context from within Europe, which is why there's so much frustration and challenge, especially coming out of Poland and a number of other countries. So Germany has taken the approach of its migration law and, and, and imposed it on looking at third country nationals and, and how it reviews it. It's using existing architecture and framework. So my background is, is, of course, on the migration side primarily, and many of the challenges with respect to the posting of third country nationals also applies to the normal labor market, to the normal issuance of work permits, to visas. Much of the frustration is related to just the simple administrative lack of, of availability of the German authorities to handle this. So as that is a starting point, um, the, as I said, the visa is, is the, main, uh, the main document, the main requirement uh, to be applied for prior to entry to Germany. And so again, that's, that's the, the major side of this that any um, company, any individual traveling to Germany should know. You need to have that, uh, that visa up front. Now, Germany has taken the approach of any stay of more than 90 days is usually the issuance of a long-term visa. That's the D visa. Um, and, and again, that ties together closely with the national migration law. Not a lot of pushback on that, but that is a starting point of those longer stays. For shorter stays, however, of less than 90 days, that's the, the short-term Schengen C visa. And, then, and, and that's where I go back to what I said just a minute ago. That's a very unique construct within Europe because, again, the individual who could be applying for the Vanderbilt's provision uh, uh, would already have residence within Europe, and so the freedom of movement. So, so and, and again, this is a challenge we see even for U.S. nationals sometimes applying for, for visas, needing to obtain a short-term C visa, and we, we know that U.S. nationals or Canadian or Australian nationals don't usually require that. 
And so, as a result, the consulates are not really well prepared, especially in Warsaw here. In, 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 in Poland, the consulate is just not prepared. They do not have appointments, um, sometimes for weeks and for months. Uh, and so a company should apply for that visa. Um, they need to go through in advance, obtain an appointment, wait sometimes multiple weeks, and then go through a long list of documents, again, which seems to go against the spirit of the, the original van der Elst judgment. But in essence, Germany calls this the van der Elst visa. And many of the instances uh, that were provided in, in the earlier sessions, the, the egregious examples of uh, the local police in Germany, they're, they are not familiar with some of these provisions. And, and that's why you end up with some, some of these really terrible stories. So that's maybe a starting point for Germany is you're going to probably need a visa. Just one exception before I, before I pass back. Um, Germany has taken a, a liberal approach only with those who hold long-term or permanent residence in another member state, but only on the basis of an EU, uh, an, an EU-based permanent residence, not the national uh, not, not a national permanent residence. So again, if you have, um, say, permanent residence in Poland as a third country national, but only under national legislation, that person may still need to go through this German process. However, if it's on the basis of an, of an EU-derived uh, permanent residence, in that case, presumably a German border official, a police officer, I'm not always sure they would know, have this distinction in mind, but they should allow that person to travel in without any advance notification. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Um, well, just to follow up, do you see, okay, we are always off, in favor of compliance, but do you see really a risk of non-compliance due to that administrative burden companies are confronted with? Or do you see also, well, alternative that these, these companies, also German companies are seeking for because they see the administrative burden they are confronted with with this Van der Els visa. So, yeah, uh, can you perhaps also mm -hmm. try to answer that? Yeah, and, and I think, as the examples show, the, the German authorities are not afraid of imposing sanctions. You, uh, unfortunately, the first layer of that sanction is on the individual, the unfortunate person caught in that, and that's, that's terrible. Um, uh, but as we can see, there are instances of sanctions of uh, a, a deportation dropping individuals off near the border. We, we, we heard um, from one of the earlier examples, many examples of this. Um, but fines as well to, to employing companies uh, of up to a half million euro. Now, I, I've never seen that number, but that's permissible uh, within Germany. Um, so, so really high levels of, of, of fines, penalties. Um, but but to, to your other point, Frederick, um, be, because the underlying work of, of obtaining a work permit in Germany is so um, it's, it takes such a long time now. It's not the most complicated, but it can take three, four months. Uh, the German government has acknowledged a shortage of workers in that sector. And so this, this is going to, be re going to remain a very active topic because German companies may be seeking for that service from outside of Germany with other, within other member states. So we would echo the need for you know, some sort of uh, consolidated approach to this. So yeah, please. Yeah, and if, if these people are fined, uh, are there cases that come before the court, the German courts, and what are German courts doing with that? As, as a lawyer, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, because courts can sooner or later send the, the issue back uh, forward to the Court of Justice. Yeah, I, I, oftentimes the fine, the, they'll, they'll impose a fine, and then an individual need to sign off that they promise, they understand if they come back, they will, a fine will be imposed against them. And then if they were to then re-enter Germany, then they would be taken up to, to the court level. This happens even at airports as well. So I know we're, we're talking about the context and thinking of people driving on a, in a car or on a bus, but this happens every day in Frankfurt where individuals don't have the right permit. They, they, they're interrogated for, for a night and then they're sent home on the next flight, sign, I'm not going to return, but if I do, um, I will then have to go to court. So we don't actually see a lot of these arriving at the higher levels, it's usually the fear of returning, and so they never actually do so. And therefore, it's never litigated to a higher level to be resolved by a court. Okay, thank you, Hans. Sure. Well, um, let's go to one of the main sending member states of post the third country nationals, namely Slovenia. Uh, Grega, uh, when you look um, at the figures of Slovenia, 
Uh, first of all, yeah, then the question is, are you surprised to see um, the high numbers? And, and secondly, yeah, um, what is the current policy uh, in Slovenia with regard to posted third country nationals? Uh, and explains this, the, the enormous uh, importance of posted third country nationals sent from Slovenia to other member states. Yes, hello, thank you, uh, Frederick, for having me. Well, Slovenia, as you, can, you have seen, is one of the most uh, sending countries. Uh, whether you asked once, is it a business model or not? Um, truly, whether it is or not, uh, people are just trying to survive and employers are trying to, to engage and, and um, to organize work in different ways. Um, that's the main issue. And posting of workers is one of the possibilities, maybe, and it's not even the easiest one. Because if you look at tax law and social security law and labor law, it's, it's a bit of a mess. And um, sometimes at such conferences I was asked, do you have A1 form with you? Do you have it? <laughs> and, I mean, uh, if the uh, uh, inspector at Pratsi would come, I would say we are not providing services because we are not paid. Our employers are not paid, so we are we're okay. But it's always an issue of A1 forms and quite many case law also on that issue which opens um, um, another issue of, but we can discuss that later, of regularization and, and uh, uh, other issues of European Union law. Well, as, as to Slovenia, we have changed the rules quite recently. It, they will apply from the 1st of January next year. They are stricter a bit. Um, so you have the employers who are posting workers should prove that they're not just letterbox companies, that they have certain number of employees working for them at least for six months. Um, there was also an issue of paying social security contributions because there was uh, big news in Germany that Slovenian uh, are working in social dumping area in a, in a sense because the contributions were paid on a similar salary in Slovenia, which was usually minimum salary. And minimum salary in Slovenia is currently 1,200 euro, whereas in Austria I think it's around 1,500 euro, in Germany 12 euro per hour, which would be around 2,000 a month, something like that. And then contributions were paid from a lower salary. That is being corrected, so that will be contributions will be paid on actual salary. And also, um, once the formal law was passed in 2017-18, you could see that the number of postings dropped and the number of simultaneous employment rose. Now, that was the reason because for posting you had to show that you have paid taxes and for simultaneous employment that was not such rule. Now it will be corrected as well, so both kinds of working in another country or providing services in another country will be equalized. I, I think the last point you were referring to, to, well, make all the checks before issuing an importable document A1, I think it's really important, of course, because, well, one of our concerns was, of course, do they really provide substantial activities uh, in Slovenia? And when you look sometimes at, at the data we have, uh, it gives the impression that they do not all the time really provide any activities in, in Slovenia. Um, so, that, that, so that remains a concern. Um, so do you think that um, the, the competent institution in Slovenia really check everything before issuing a portable document, A1? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you have seen cases and from Bulgaria, even Spain, even, even Slovak Republic, the recent one, DRV that the institutions are a bit slower. Now, I think in Slovenia that is being checked. Um, we have also in the, in the law that uh, as uh, A2 form or decision of the Administrative Commission that you should be um, insured for at least two months in a country before posted for self-employed, for workers one month. That is being uh, applied, but I think um, it's the history as well. We have good connections to former republics of, of the republics of former Yugoslavia, now independent states, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and Serbia, and they have easier access to Slovenian labor market. So it's easier for them to come to Slovenia and then be posted to, to other member states. Do you have also an idea of the profile of the, the posting uh, undertakings? Do they also have the Bosnian nationality, or do you see that it are mainly Slovenian companies sending out third country nationals? Because it, it might also be the case that these are third country nationals employers sending out also uh, yeah, Bosniers. Well, I would expect you to have the numbers. 
but <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, but it's usually, I think, Slovenian companies. They're organizing work uh, in Slovenia and also in other member states. But you know, for Slovenia, it's not a big, a big problem sending people to another member states. We have, you know, as receiving member state, a bit of a problem because there are also Slovaks uh, sent to Slovenia, especially in construction. And, and it's mainly construction, I think, from Slovaks. And, so it's usually for the country where you work that has con concerns with posted, posted uh, third country nationals. But you know, as we have heard, maybe it's a deeper issue because we have heard about labor shortages and um, service provision. So where do they meet? Do they meet at all? Mm. And in, interestingly enough, European Commission versus Austria, there was a notion about regularization. And, and I don't know, I mean, do we really speak the same language in Europe? Do we really mutually trust each other? Or we don't trust each other? So are we one Europe or not? I mean, we can discuss it about posting, but there are also other issues when other countries are involved. So I think that's one of the issues, uh, maybe the deeper ones, and now we can discuss the details, of course. Thank you, Grega. Uh, I think we need to go to Spain. Um, well, of course, I already referred to it, uh, to that yeah, well-known Terra Fucundis case. Uh, Laura, can you briefly explain somewhat better the, the Terra Fucundis case? And also, well, what were the main consequences um, of, of this Terra Fucundis case for all the economic actors involved? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frederic, for having me. Um, well, this is Terra Fucundis. What I want to underline here is a French case by the moment. It's just a French case. We have, I have been looking for the, 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 the judgments. We have four judgments by the moment. And all of them are against this Spanish company that is, um, is working, is, the name is Terra Fecundis Work for All. They are using more the second part of the name uh, lately. And it's a temporary working agency based in Spain in the agricultural sector. And this company has started to post workers to, to France, to Italy, to Portugal in the 2002. And they have also uh, another company called TerraBus that take the, the, the workers by bus from Spain to, to the south of France. Uh, in, this, in these cases, well, there are no, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's called the Terra Fecundis case, but it's not a European case. Perhaps in the future it, it arrives to the, to, the, to the European Court of Justice. The company wants that. I don't know, they are asking for that. And, and we will see, uh, it's, it's under appeal. And, and, and what are these cases about? Well, uh, it's, it's the first thing is very notorious because the French press, the, in, even the academia, um, is showing this case as a model of exploitation of fraudulent practices that could be associated with posting. Um, the, the, the thing is that the, the social security, the Spanish Social Security Administration and the inspection says the contrary. And, 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 and what is the, 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 the cases are, they are not under the umbrella of the posting, um, the posting coverage because they say that it's a letterbox company and, and the workers, the, the third country nationals from Ecuador, from South America, they are not uh, working habitually in Spain. It's not a migration case, it's about the, the social security mainly, but um, the Spanish social security has, uh, has led some so, uh, inspections and they say no, it's not a letterbox company and Spain has not withdrawn the, the, the PD-1 and it seems that they are not going to do so and, and they are dialoguing from, from the 2017, the first time the, the French come to the, to the Spanish, they are working there from 2002 and then in, in 2017 they say that the PD-1 they were not correct. And in this case, the, the Spanish Social Security has been investigating. They are, they are talking, the two institutions, they, are, they don't have any agreement, and they are going to start the second phase of the dialogue and, and conciliation procedure. And, and, and in this case, we will see what happens, and then we have the conciliation board, but 
In the meantime, we have three judgments. The first judgment was in 2021, and we have very, very strong uh, uh, um, uh, sen the sentence against the company is half million euros. In this case, the owners fines from uh, 100,000 euros and prison sentences of four years and prohibition to operate in France. In these cases, for me, it's, it's, it's curious. There are no workers at all. They, they are not part of the cases. Uh, they are not complainants, and, 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 and in the Marseille uh, judgments, there are no uh, farmers either. There are no French farmers involved. Um, they say, I have just said before, they, they are not covered by the freedom of, of providing services. The, the French judgment says that they have to be established in France uh, to, to, uh, to employ workers and pay social contributions in, in France. Uh, they say that it's a concealed worker because uh, concealed work because they don't have gone to the the social security uh, and taxes. Um, they, they haven't report they are going to to employ these persons there. And as they are third country nationals, they say that they are trafficking with with labor. Um, well, as the Spanish social security they haven't disregard, uh, haven't um, withdrawn this this PD one. They apply this famous doctrine, the, the, judge, the, the, the this judgment from Marseille. They apply the Altun doctrine, and I, I don't agree the way they do. But but they say that they are they disregard the the the, the PD one from Spain, and also says that for me it's quite curious. They say no, uh, it declares the mandatory application of French social security law. Uh, and, and for me, uh, well, Altun Doctrine uh, does not allow to change the applicable law. It's true that they are not, they, they can't, uh, they can't uh, insure this, this third country national. They are not, ha they don't have working permit there. And, but this is a very important statement because that opens the way to civil liability. And the second, uh, 11 months later, the second uh, judgment from this uh, Marseille court uh, has uh, obliged, uh, has ordered the company to pay more than 80 million euros for the unpaid contributions. Uh, the complative trade unions obtained the payment of 30,000 euros and the French Farmers Confederation obtained 10,000 euros. Uh, there is another criminal uh, judgment in, in Nîmes. This is another court there in the south of France in April 2022. And then the, the, for the first time, the farmers are involved. And seven French user farms, we are talking that uh, Terra Fecundis in the last period, they, they have around 500 farms as clients. Only seven French user farms were found guilty for working for, with Terra Fecundis, and only one of them was sentenced to send six months of prison uh, for housing uh, in an unsanitary condition of, they say that it's all filth and horrible places for, for the workers posted there. Um, uh, also, in, in this case, the URSAF, that is the, the Social Security Administration in France, is not involved because some days before, uh, they, with a letter, they say that they wanted to be involved, and the case, the reason that it seems to be the reason that they are not involved in because they are in the civil part of the sentence, is because they, they haven't mm, taken in, in touch with Spain, uh, asking for the for the for the withdrawal of the of the of the um, of the PD one. It was the, it was um, it was they haven't get in touch yet. If I may, Lula, um, Sorry. what are the, the key lessons learned from that specific case? Because, well, uh, hearing you, I think um, there are, I think, uh, several observations that we can make. Namely, first of all, I see also sometimes a difference in interp interpretation between yeah. administration with regard to the portable document A1. Yeah. Uh, for instance, here the example was given between France and, and Spain, where you have, might have different interpretations. Secondly, okay, this, this is also a good example. How, how political sensitive this is in, in France, of course. Um, uh, but of course, the, our main concern is always with regard to third country nationals. Well, th to some extent, they are, yeah, show higher risk of, of being yeah, vulnerable to, to certain uh, situation. Um, so the outcome of it, um, do you think that these workers are now better off after this case, yes or not? Well, they are not better because they are not part of these, these cases. 
They, they are not there. They, 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 are, uh, they have work permits in, in, in Spain. They have residence permits. And the, the Spanish inspector, they, they say that they are working there. They are specialized in agriculture. The, the farmers are in the shortage of, 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 of labor shortages, and they, they wanted to have them because they, are, they have been working in agriculture before. We have a, a, an agreement with, with Ecuador, a, a bilateral agreement. So in the case of these persons, they can be insured in France. The, the Spain has maintained the insurance. And so they have maintained the, 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 the residence permit. Because if Spain has said, no, I'm going to withdraw that, they, are, they would be without the, the insurance uh, coverage, without the, the, the residence permit. So I think for, for them, I think it's, 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 it's not a, a good idea. It's, it's true that there are some uh, non-compliance in labor. And I, I think that we have to, 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 to differentiate social security a labor non-compliance. And I think it's, it's very important that because a company that, in, in this case, they pay the minimum French salary. It is proven. But it's true that they don't pay in all the time the overtime. It is proven. And in this case, there is a labor and non-compliance. But even in this case, the, the PD1 could be correct. And, and they mix fraud in labor and social security. And I think it's not a good idea. Okay. I think this is an important takeaway. Um, well, now going to the Commission, no, asking a lot of questions, of course, to, to Carita. Um, Carita, when you well, look at the presentations of, of this morning, but in general, uh, the ongoing discussions about posting third country nationals, um, what do you see as the main issues that, that could or should be tackled? And then the second question, if you see some issues, what can be then potential solutions for these issues to be tackled? A lot of questions, I know, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Frederick, and uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start with the obvious. Uh, posting is always a controversial topic, and uh, as was said also by uh, Madam Undersecretary Kroll, that uh, it's difficult to find a balance between the freedom to provide services on the one hand and uh, workers' rights uh, on the other. Uh, when um, mm, listening uh, discussions about um, posted third, third country nationals, um, I would say that uh, the, the problems that are raised are, are very, very similar when we talk about also the posting of uh, EU nationals. Um, it, um, I would maybe bring out uh, three points, uh, not, uh, not necessarily in, uh, in uh, order of uh, importance, but uh, I think there is a lot of, um, mm, there is an issue of uh, abuse and circumvention of rules out there, and uh, due to that there is a lot of uh, mistrust uh, between the member states. Uh, and uh, when we, we have heard today a lot that there is also case, uh, court case law, there is EU legislation, yet there is uh, many different interpretations in different uh, member states. Uh, uh, I think we also have to ask ourselves why are these interpretations there? They are probably um, reaction to some action. So um, I think um, we need to... Um, we need uh, one of the first questions, sorry to be a bit uh, not coherent, but one of the first questions that was asked here today was how to use best use the resources we have in Europe. So um, one of the resources that exists already now for some years, and Mr. Puyanju was also telling us about the activities of the European Labour Authority. Uh, I think we need to use all the resources uh, of the European Labour Authority when we talk about um, uh, posted third country nationals, uh, because it all starts, uh, first of all, um, building trust between member states. Uh, this can be done um, by um, bringing them together uh, around one table, so I'm talking here about administrative cooperation. Uh, but it also, I think, uh, what we need to do is there, are, there is a multi multiplicity of um, 
of uh, laws and actors that are intertwined here, which is not the case in, in uh, EU uh, member states' national postings. So uh, there is that, that adds a layer of complexity, which we also need to deal with uh, to see what are the, who are the actors, what are the specific rules in member states, um, to be uh, more informed. So two of my key points, what should be done, I think we should... Uh, we should have more information, we should exchange information between each other, and we should have more cooperation between member states. Um, and um, third uh, point, uh, I think, is protection of third country uh, nationals. Uh, in a way, I think they are more uh, vulnerable position than uh, EU nationals, and uh, we should really see also how to um, how to protect them, because if the, if the outcome of, uh, of an in inspection is a deportation of a, of a third country national, that is a, uh, that is a very um, strong um, signal or strong punishment for that, uh, for that, uh, for that worker. Um, uh, I'm afraid I do not have uh, solutions uh, uh, ready at hand here, but uh, the European Commission is very much willing to work together with, with ELA and with all the member states uh, on this. Thank you, Carita. Um, yeah, everyone is always looking at the Commission, and um, not longer only at the Commission now, also everyone is looking at ELA. Uh, but there is, of course, also the responsibility of, of the national member states themselves. Um, um, and, well, one of the questions I also have uh, to Carita is, okay, we see sometimes the request for an additional legal initiative. We see also, well, we had a lot of discussion about the review of the Posting of Workers Directive. Is there a need also to, to review the Enforcement Directive? All important questions, but when you look at the content of the Enforcement Directive, when you look at well, the changes now made in the Posting of Workers Directive, do you see, yeah, give one element or perhaps two elements which is really important for the, for the national member states where they can do more uh, and, and, bene and, and use that also to better guarantee also the social rights of third country nationals? I think, uh, as was said also, also uh, today already by, by Hervik as well, that uh, the legal framework uh, for posted workers and uh, third country nationals well, is, um, is the same, there is no difference. Um, uh, this question indeed has also been, um, been raised in the Commission whether there is a need for um, more protection or uh, specific rules for uh, third country uh, posted workers. Uh, that is why also we are currently conducting a study, um, which is a very, very broad study, which will be published hopefully still second quarter this year. It is about um, all workers who decide to go and work temporarily in another member state. So that's covering uh, posted workers, but as well those workers who move through intermediaries, and the study will look very specifically on the situation of uh, workers in subcontracting chains and also workers uh, from third country, uh, posted workers from third, country, third countries. Um, and uh, uh, from, the, from the preliminary results, I think we can already see that there is indeed a difference uh, in, in protection uh, of uh, third country posted uh, workers that uh, they uh, th there is e more breaches when it comes to to them. Um, uh, however, mm, I think it comes down still to the enforcement of rules on national level. Uh, and again, here I think uh, uh, Ella is the, is the magic word who uh, who can uh, um, help uh, member states. Uh, so um, again, I'm not sure I replied no, directly no to your question, but. Uh, <laughs> No problem. Thanks. Um, we are already over time. Um, I know break is very important uh, during conferences, but I would like to have just one, two additional minutes just to ask you, well, what are for you the, what's for you the key message with regard to third country, posted third country national, or what's your recommendation, because we have here the commission, we have ELLA, um, so what could be, yeah, 
for you, what's your key message or what's your yeah, main um, conclusion or recommendation? Perhaps I start with Hans. Sure, thank you. So just to, to, to keep it quick, um, for the moment, I, you know, I, I gave some examples of the challenges with Germany, which many of you are, are aware of, the visa issuance issues. Um, I don't think we're going to see dramatic changes anytime soon. Uh, so we need to be practical and pragmatic about what the solutions are. I know that um, most would like some action, top-down action, but that's not always easy within the existing institutions. There's give and take in negotiations, member state to member state level. Um, what I would recommend though, where there is, um, where, where if you encounter a situation where you know you need to be posting workers to Germany, knowing of the existing regime in place, um, give yourself as much time in advance to get the appointment, have the documents ready, the contract uh, between, between the, uh, yourself and the, the, the host company purchasing the services. Germany is going to ask for a lot of documents. They will push back. They're, they're making it difficult. So to the extent you can be pragmatic and, and just handle the situation as best as possible, have those documents ready, give yourself enough time, prepare the individual before they travel. Um, that this could be a bit, it could be a bit difficult. Uh, it could be difficult at their appointment, but that, that's the reality of it. And then just really quickly, at a, you know, we would love to see ELA, we'd love to see the commission be more involved, maybe use existing directives, use the existing posted worker directive perhaps. Germany has taken a very light touch on that. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's room within that to, to bring some harmony to the provisions of, uh, between the different member states. So that yeah. might be. Thank you, Hans, for this well, practical recommendation also to the, the posting undertakings. Grega, do you have one specific recommendation or conclusion you, you can make? Yes, thank you, Frederick. I think it's important not to forget that also posted workers are workers. They work to earn something and to survive. And it's for the employers to find the, the, the way of organizing work. You know, if you make one barrier, it's like the water, they will find another one. And that's why it's important that member states cooperate. I've said mutual cooperation, uh, sincere cooperation and mutual trust. I have my doubts that member states cooperate sincerely at the moment and trust has to be earned. And that's why we need more Europe in our minds and in our legislation as well. Herwig has mentioned the directive. But I have my doubts that the directive will be passed because of particular interests of the member states. So we have to rely on what we have, ELA, Commission, and member states. They have to think more European and set particular interests aside, if possible. That's a nice uh, recommendation. Thank you, Krega. Lula? Yeah, I only say that the third country nationals can be a second, second class uh, workers. I think once they are legalized, they have to have the same rights. And, and also, I want to say the available, we need more data, you know that very well, and the available that data doesn't show a generalized problem of fraud or posting of workers. I don't know if these third country nationals of, of Terra Fecundis would be better in, 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 a, in a regular migration in, in France, because uh, sometimes the problem is not... It's not a posting, it's the, the situation in some sectors. I have read lots of, of, of reports of the situation of, of workers in the agricultural sector, and there are a lot of non-compliance. So the problem is precarization, the, the situation of this person. And, and, and in my opinion, the, the main uh, topic that it has to be dealt is the, the, the question of the social security coverage of these persons, because in the case of a regularization, there is, uh, under Article 16, we have the problem of the work permits. So in the case that they can be uh, uh, regularized in the, in the host member state, they have to keep the contributions in the, in the home member state. I think it's something that's a red line for, for these persons. Okay, thank you, Lola. And then I'm looking to Herwig for perhaps the yeah, main observation, the conclusion. No, I, I think it's, it's clear that a lot of issues are not, are not, from a legal point of view, from an administrative point of view, uh, are not settled. And, and that discussions go on and you can have a pragmatic approach. Uh, but yeah, as an academic, I would say, yeah, pragmatic approach is okay, but sooner or later, maybe the rules should be made more clear. And I, I mentioned the questions that are open. 
if these questions are not answered by the institutions uh, and by the member states, then sooner or later it will be the Court of Justice that's going to decide. And 30 years after Van der Rels, uh, um, yeah, what will be then the outcome of cases that sooner or later will come up to the Court of Justice? Are we going to give so much power to the Court of Justice to rule this? Uh, because 30 years after Van der Rels, it, I think it's not easy to predict what finally the court will do in each of these cases. And these are judgments linked to a specific case and cannot always be applied in other cases. Um, so I think uh, the, the political institutions or institutions like ELA, including the member states, should yeah, indeed cooperate better to make clear what, under what conditions third country nationals can be posted uh, within Europe and also strengthening the legitimacy of this posting of third country nationals because in the general public and in the press it is discussed and it's, it's put in, a, in, in sometimes in a, in a bad context. Okay, thank you, Harry. That's all the time we have uh, for this panel discussion. Um, I know that you have a lot of questions, but during the break you can uh, ask all the panel members, especially the commission, of course, uh, if you have specific questions, but certainly I think you have a lot of recommendations uh, to the Commission. But uh, last but not least, I would like to thank you um, for your expertise and, and to provide uh, all your knowledge uh, during this panel session. Thank you very much.